you have a Bible with you, uh, you can turn to the, the Gospel of Mark, chapter 3. The message that God put on my heart tonight is Discipleship 101, or what it means to follow Jesus. <coughs> now, just to loosen things up, I recently heard a joke, it was pretty good. And it's been, it's rare. Yeah. But uh, there was a couple, a pastor and his wife. And uh, his wife was going on a trip, and they're in their bedroom, and she was packing, getting ready for the trip. And uh, she said, uh, well, i got to go, honey, but uh, do me a favor. There's a box under the bed, a little shoe box. Don't look in the box while I'm gone. Okay. So she leaves, and he's making the bed, and he kicks this box under the bed, and he just can't help himself, right? So he looks in the box, and... And there's three eggs and a wad of cash, $1 bills. Maybe about $200 in $1 bills. And he thinks, that's strange. He puts it away. Well, the wife comes home from the trip and she says, uh, you looked in the box, didn't you? And he says, yeah. Yeah, I looked in the box. He says, so what's up with the eggs? And she says, well, every time you preach a bad sermon, I put an egg in the box. <laughs> and he's thinking, three eggs? Not bad, right? He says, only three eggs? And she says, well, every time I got a dozen, I sold them for a dollar. <laughs> Jesus Christ came to reach a world, to launch a worldwide enterprise. But the question is, how do you reach a world? And though it makes sense to me that an infinite God would have come up with an infinite number of means to get the job done, I'm shocked and baffled by the method which he chose. How did Jesus Christ set out to reach a world? 
The answer comes to us from his own lips in the form of a command to the church. Make disciples of all nations. You see, the strategy of Jesus was to pour into the lives of 12 open-hearted men. To pour out his time. To pour out his knowledge. To pour out his passion for eternal things. To pour out his sacrificial love for people. But these were not just any men. They were willing men. Willing to receive the outpour of the Lord Jesus into their lives. Willing to be taught his principles. Willing to practice his disciplines. Willing to be corrected at his rebuke. But most importantly, they were willing to follow him wherever he went. Even to death. But what does it mean to follow Christ? Too often, I think the church can be likened to the four blind men who touched an elephant to learn what it is like. And one grabbed hold of a leg, another took the tail, another grabbed the trunk, and the last grabbed a tusk. The blind man who felt a leg said, the elephant is like a pillar. The one who felt the tail said, the elephant is like a rope. The one who felt the trunk said, the elephant is like a tree branch. And the one who felt the tusk said, the elephant is like a solid pipe. And many times, we can become so entrenched in all of the peripheral issues of the church that we can become blind to the big picture. And the tragedy is that we begin to measure our success with the wrong measuring stick. As Professor Howard Hendricks of Dallas Theological Seminary used to say to his students, my great fear for you is not that you will fail, but that you will succeed in doing the wrong thing. You see, the true test of any church is not how many are in the pews, but what kind. And if we call ourselves Christians, we ought to know the scriptural target for which we are supposed to be aiming. Because as Hendricks also said, if you do not know where you are going, then any road can take you there. So tonight I would like to paint a picture of the whole elephant. And in the process, my prayer is that we would all be given grace to examine ourselves in light of the scripture to see what kind are we. And second, that we might possess the proper measuring stick with which to evaluate our own walk and service to the Lord. So tonight we would like to ask and answer three questions. First, we want to ask and answer the question, what is a disciple? And in our passage we have three characteristics of a Christian disciple in verse 13. And I'd like them to, to bring them to your attention right now. First, a disciple is a called person. Now the New Testament gives us two distinct callings. And two different Greek words are used to differentiate between those callings. When Jesus said in Matthew 22, 14, many are called, but few are chosen. The word is kaleo, and it means call in the general sense. And in the context, it refers to the general call of salvation, a call of invitation to become part of the kingdom of God. And what he is saying is that many people will be called to repent from their sin, called to obey the gospel, and become a child of God. But only a small minority of those who are called will accept that invitation, while the majority, by their rejection, will reveal that they were not God's chosen. And as Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. But the word that is used in this passage is proskaleo, and it refers to a specific call to a specific task. A Christian disciple is a person who has already responded to the general call of salvation. And they are now walking in the, in the specific calling of God to a specific task given by God. 
Their mission is not simply to go to church on Sunday. Their function is not primarily as a warm body to sit in a pew once a week. Someone once compared the Christian church to a football game in which there were 30 men on the field in desperate need of rest, <coughs> surrounded by thousands of fans in the stands in desperate need of exercise. <laughs> you see, a disciple is on the field. A disciple is a Christian who is actively pursuing the specific call of God on their lives. And for them, their salvation experience is simply the point of entry. Salvation is the prerequisite to knowing the specific will of God for your life. And I cannot think of anything more exciting than to know the specific purpose for which I was created. Can you? To know why. What did the Creator have in mind when He made me? But as we will see, this knowledge does not come cheap. Note the second characteristic of, of a disciple, that he or she is a chosen person. Now this is not referring simply to the election of God to salvation, although that is assumed in discipleship. This is showing us that Jesus, the disciple maker, personally chose his disciples. These men to whom he would eventually entrust his ministry after he was gone. What was the basis of his choice? Well, we read in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, that he spent all night in prayer before he chose the twelve. Why? Because he was far less concerned with the personal qualifications of people than he was with the sovereign will of God in the process of making disciples. See, we tend to focus on the wrong things about people. Which is why we need the Father's help. We'll say if that person is anointed, God will do mighty things with him. And then of another person, if he could only get his act together, you know, pew pusher, crawling out the back, right at the invitation. Yeah. And we think, what a waste. And yet God's criteria is totally different than ours. God is not concerned about their act being together. Just look at the twelve, the apostles. I mean, this was the biggest collection of boneheads in scriptures. <laughs> they were in, think about it. They were in constant contact with the supernatural power of Jesus Christ. Okay? They repeatedly heard all of the best teaching. Remember, Jesus couldn't put it on tape. Three and a half years he was out there in, in Israel repeating himself. The teaching. You could say it all in about two and a half hours. You read it straight down, and Jesus is out there saying it over and over and over. You know, they got all the pearls. They knew it well. And I just imagine them sitting there on the hill looking at each other. This is fantastic. <laughs> I mean, life-changing stuff. Jesus, yeah, this is great. Look at all the people. What, Lord? Give them something to eat? Give them something to eat? Do I look like a taco cart? <laughs> Give them something to eat. There's thousands of them. What do you mean give them something to eat? If I saved my salary for a year, I couldn't even afford them a snack. <laughs> and I just imagine Jesus looking at him like, I walked on water the other night. Yeah. Remember that trip? <laughs> or in the case of the feeding of the 4,000, which was after the 5,000, I can imagine him saying, isn't this situation vaguely familiar to you guys? <laughs> you know, like the last time we sat on a hill and fed thousands of people out of thin air? I call it the Colombo technique. So, so what you're saying yeah. is I can multiply bread for 5,000 people, but not for 4,000. I mean, they were as dense as it gets. <laughs> but God specifically chose them. Why? Because to him the thought is not, if only they could get their act together, but if only they could get a hold of my grace, then I could work in their life. You see, God never looks at a person as they are, but he always sees people in terms of what they can become as a product of his grace. Do you have that insight about people? I don't know. 
And we better pray. We better pray about who we're discipling. We better get a word from Jesus. Because even Jesus had a wipe out his group. And it was one of the others that, it, it was one that the others thought were a sure thing, right? Judas, real spiritual individual. They even trusted him with the money. You know? Son of perdition, financial ministry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he was on top of it. And yet the perspective of man is so different from the perspective of God. And I know you may be thinking, why did Jesus choose us? Well, the greater question is, why did he choose me? Well, a disciple is not only a called person and a chosen person, but a disciple is an obedient person. The text says in verse 15, he's, he called them and they came to him. He said, follow, they follow. It was that simple. See, for all of the failures of these men, they had one thing going for them, which enabled them to hang in there with the Lord. They stuck with Him. Even though they stepped all over themselves in the process. Now, Simon Peter voiced it best when all the disciples walked away from Jesus in John chapter 6 because the sermon was too harsh. You know, He wasn't being sensitive to their personal theology. All this talk about eating the flesh and drinking the blood of the Son of Man. And they left. And he looked down at the twelve and he said, maybe you should go too. And Simon brilliantly blurts out, where else would we go? <laughs> you have the words of eternal life. Maybe that cry of Peter echoes in your heart tonight. But has God brought you to the point where you would cry out, what else could I do but obey him? What else could I do but obey you, Lord? That is very different. And tonight I ask you, are you compelled by his love to pay the price of obedience? Because that is the price of discipleship. Sacrificial obedience. You see, salvation comes at no cost to us. Because Jesus paid the price. He purchased it with his own life. But to be his disciple may cost you everything. And the question is, are you willing to pay the price? So to summarize, a disciple is a called person, called to a task. A chosen person. Chosen by a disciple maker, by way of the sovereign counsel of God himself. And an obedient person. Someone who is willing to pay the cost of following Jesus. The second question we would like to ask and answer from this text is, what are disciples called to do? And in verses 14 and 15, we're shown three essential tasks of the Christian disciple. Note, the first and most important thing Jesus Christ calls his disciples to do is to be with him. There's a reason for the order. In other words, cultivate your relationship with the Savior. In fact, Jesus summed up the entire concept of eternal life in one verse, John 17, 3, when he prayed, And this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. The word know in this passage is gnosko in the Greek, and it refers to an experiential knowledge, first-hand knowledge. And in the context... It refers to an understanding and realization of who God is through a personal relationship with Him. And I think when we hear that, we've, we, be, we have become desensitized uh, by the lingo of evangelists. You know, when we hear that God wants a personal relationship with us. But meditate on that for just a second. You know. Think on that for just a minute. The creator of the universe wants a relationship with you. With me. Okay, let me help you put this into practice. Think about a famous person on earth that you have always dreamed about hanging out with for one day. Alright, think about that person. Get him in your head. 
You have it? Everyone got one in mind? Okay. That person will never give you the time of day. They don't even know who you are. They could care less whether you lived or died. Yet the creator of the universe wants to have the most intimate relationship imaginable with you. A relationship that is so fulfilling and all-consuming that every other relationship in your life can only foreshadow bits and pieces of it. It's the heart of the gospel. Not only did Jesus die for you, lay down his life to, to um, turn God's way of wrath, uh, turn God's wrath away from you, but through his sacrifice, we become children of God, friends with the Creator, adopted into his own family, eternal objects of the most unconditional and beautiful love ever known living with Him in a new heaven and a new earth, which will never perish. Hello? Amen. We talked about that in Sunday school this morning. We had a lot of fun talking about heaven. We just went, down, went to chapter 21 and 22 of Revelation and just went, wow. <laughs> Is that what it's going to be like? But Lord... I need my eight hours of sleep. I have an awful lot to do today. But don't worry. I'll see you Sunday. And may I remind you, I never miss a Sunday. Or, that's nice, Lord. I can't wait until I'm in heaven, and then we can really start to have a good time. I wonder if Jesus plays tennis. I really miss playing tennis. I can't do it anymore. I wonder if I'll play tennis and Let me clue you in on a biblical secret. When you get to heaven, you're not going to look for the tennis courts. You're going to look for Jesus. You're going to go around crying. Where is Jesus? Where is he? Where is my Savior? I want to see him. I want to look at him and see the scars. I want to look into the eyes of the man who loved me so much that he would rather die than be without me. Where is Jesus? I hope you know how much he loves you tonight. If you do, are you receiving that love? If you do not cultivate your relationship with Him, if you're not daily coming before Him, broken and humble, and letting Him pour His unconditional love into your life, I have bad news. That means you're going to start looking for it from people. And as Jesus said to the woman at the well, whoever drinks of this water will thirst again, and again, and again. And you will go looking for person after person to satisfy your need for significance and for worth, and you'll always come up short. Amen. Why? Because you didn't stay at the foot of the cross. You didn't see your great worth in the eyes of Jesus. That he would die for you, even while you were his enemy. That he would love you, even though you were unlovable. And I know so many Christians, the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, dwells in them, and yet they refuse to be comforted. They're destroying all of their relationships simply because they will not receive the love of God. They refuse to be ministered to by the Lord. And therefore, they're incapable of receiving love from anybody. How will they go to church? You know, they, they, they profess their great faith and knowledge. They, they shout hallelujah. They raise their hands in worship. But all the while, they're festering. They're, they're stewing in bitterness. Unwilling. And therefore, incapable of being set free by the love of God. Unable even to receive genuine love from people when it is given. Has Jesus called you to be with Him? Oh, it's so important. I do not care what it is that is distracting you from Him, if there are distractions. I just know that it's not worth it. Because it is better to die in the Lord than to keep living out of fellowship with the Lord. Do you have His peace? Do you have His joy? 
you have his heart for people? If you do not, you're not his disciple. You've not paid the price. You've not joined the fellowship of his sufferings. And God is begging you tonight to choose your life or his. Your rights or his lordship. Your hobbies or his service. Your favorite TV show or his word. By the way, the word of God is not a nice option. It's a survival feature. You can't make it without it. See, these are the choices a disciple must make every day. And it is the very choices that will define whether or not you are a true disciple. Would you be with him? Or would you rather do something else? There's a second task of a disciple, and it follows from the first. And that is that a disciple is sent out to preach. Make no mistake, there's no effective ministry without a vital, growing relationship with Jesus. There's no public act of devotion or service worth anything to God if it is not fueled and being fueled by a private, intimate, dynamic devotion to the living Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And nowhere does that become more apparent than in the ministry of preaching. You know, we get so excited when someone comes to Christ and, and we tell them, good job, welcome to the family of God. Now, now go out and tell everybody about Jesus. Go, go get them, Tiger. They just got saved. And we wonder why most of them wipe out so quickly. We wonder why they might go the rest of their life never leading a soul to Christ. It's because we jump the gun. We skip the first and most important step. You cannot impart what you do not possess. They don't have that first-hand knowledge, that experience of being with Him yet. You know, and they walk around in fear. Oh no, he's walking over here. I have my Bible. I, I know he's, I know he's going to come over. He's going to say something about Jesus. I know he's going to say something bad about Jesus. You know, God comes up to him. Hey, you believe in Jesus? Yes, I do. And he said to repent, heathen. You know, spray him with mace and run. <laughs> That was a close one. <laughs> See, I believe you that you met the Lord Jesus at a revival or at a harvest crusade way back when. I believe you had the experience. But where are you with Him now? Do you know Him better today than you did yesterday? Are you growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? If you're not, then you won't be able to tell anybody about it. Not only will you have nothing to say, but you will be lacking the power of God which enables you to actually speak in the first place. But as you draw closer to Christ through that sweet communion with His indwelling Spirit, you will be able to say with Peter, we cannot help but to say, to speak the things which we have seen and heard. Until you have seen with your own eyes, and heard with your own ears, you will not be able to speak. And that is to see the secret to preaching the gospel to a wicked, Christ-rejecting, and just generally scary world. Jesus said, Do not worry beforehand what you will say, but whatever is given, in, given you in that moment, speak that. For it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. Amen. You see, a disciple is a spokesperson for the living God, an ambassador standing in Christ's stead and pleading with the world around them, crying out, be reconciled to God. A disciple is a person who is in such close fellowship with Jesus Christ that he is dependent on Jesus for the very words that come out of his mouth, whether from the pulpit or at the grocery store. Well, the last essential task of a disciple we see in this passage is perhaps the least understood. And that is that a disciple is called to exercise authority. Now there's a verse in Matthew that gives us a glimpse of the whole concept. And in this verse, it's two verses, Jesus says, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. 
And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. He's talking to Peter. And whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. You see, when you make the choice to follow Jesus as his disciple, then we have a problem. Because now that you're with him, allowing him to love and instruct you, and now that you're naturally going out and leading others to Jesus by sharing his message, you just painted the target on your head. For who? Yeah. The adversary. The one who hates God. Never forget that if you are a Christian, you are involved in a great war for the souls of men and women. And if your desire is to come after Jesus with all of your heart, strength, mind, and soul, then get ready to find yourself in the hottest part of the battle. And there will be no break. You can't take a vacation from the war. So what is the purpose of Jesus giving this authority to his disciples? Well, it's the same purpose for which Jesus used it on earth. To bind the enemy and to set the captives free. Paul tells us the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but spiritual weapons, mighty for pulling down spiritual strongholds. In other words, removing the grip of Satan from human hearts. And your captain, your general, is the Lord Jesus himself. The only one who was able to defeat the enemy. The only one who has. But you say, well, how do we use this authority? What do you guys think? How do you use the authority that Jesus gives you? What's the big guns? Prayer. Prayer. Right? You see, we can sum it up in that one word. Ephesians 6. You know how you're to suit up with the spiritual armor? By prayer. When the disciples tried to cast a demon out of a child... And it didn't work out. They went and talked to Jesus afterwards. What happened? He says, you didn't pray. You see, this authority does not originate with you. But a disciple is a person who is a channel by which the authority of God can be exercised in different situations. Do you believe that? Do you believe the person that you've been praying for over 30 years to be saved? will actually get saved? Or do you doubt? God has already said that He desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. God has already said that He is patient, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Peter even says that's why he's waiting. That's why he's not back yet. I'm glad he didn't come back. <laughs> you know, before eight years ago at least. I would have missed the boat. But he's seeking men and women who would learn the beauty, the discipline of pouring themselves out in intercession for people. The discipline of dying to self that someone else might live just like the Savior did. You see, the gates that Jesus was talking about, they don't move. But his church is to burst through the gates the gates of hell, the gates of death, and to rescue captives, to set them free with the word of life, the gospel, which is itself the power of God, which leadeth to salvation. A disciple of Jesus Christ is one who approaches the gates of hell every day and prepares to plow through them because he knows that greater is he who is in us than he who is in the world. And if God be for us, who can be against us? What can man do? What can the demons do? What can the devil of hell himself do? Nothing. Well, we've seen what a disciple is, and we've observed what a disciple does. Now let's look at the results of discipleship in verses 16 through 19. 
And we will close with this point. Now, if you're looking at the passage, you may be wondering how we can understand the results of discipleship from a list of names. But notice, some of them have more than one name. In the scriptures, names have significance. They are always a commentary on the character of the person with that name. <laughs> and Jesus had this funny habit of renaming people. He always came up with nicknames for his disciples or surnames. Classic example, first time he meets Simon, son of John. He walks up to him without any introduction and says, You are Simon, son of John, but you shall be called Cephas, which is translated a stone. You see, Simon was a perfect description of his character. The word means heard. Heard, like with your ears. In other words, loud mouth. You heard Simon wherever he was. You know, he'll give you a piece of his mind whether you want it or not. As one teacher said, he had the most uncanny ability to open his mouth, place both feet in it, and then wonder why he couldn't walk. <laughs> but Jesus said, you shall be Cephas, a stone. See, that was a statement of Jesus, of his intention to change Simon's nature. And the interesting thing is, when you read the letters of Peter, every stereotype from his personality from the Gospels are completely missing in his epistles. They're reversed. If you read them side by side, you can't even believe the same person wrote you know, is, is, is writing these epistles. This can't be the same impulsive Peter teaching me about patience. This can't be the rugged fisherman speaking about the precious blood of Christ. Let me clue you, it's not the same person. It was a changing person. And that's what God wants to do with you. That's what God wants to do with me. He wants to change us from the inside out until we are no longer recognizable, until we are no longer defined by our past experiences and our hurts and our failures, until our old nature is dead and gone. And all that is left is a shining reflection of Jesus Christ. God's ultimate purpose for your life is that you would be so consumed in your relationship with Christ that anyone who meets you could almost say that they have met Jesus himself because you bear such a striking resemblance to him. You see, discipleship is not about knowledge. I'm not a disciple because I know lots of scripture, because I memorize it. See, I'm always trying to impress God with how much I know about his word. And he's always trying to impress me with how little like Jesus Christ I am. 